what is a limit of a function? So as you remember, when x approaches to a from left-hand side and right-hand side, the y value on y axis is getting closer and closer to the given value. Or by the definition, suppose function f is defined for all x values near a, except possibly at a itself. If f of x, which is the y value, is getting closer and closer to y, then we say that the limit of function f is equal to L. So this G is L as well. So we have different representation, different notation. Or you can write it this way. The limit of F of X as X approaches A is equal to L or equal to G. What if you have a function in two free variables? Suppose f is a function of two variables. The domain of the function is d. It includes points that are close to the point a and b. So please note that it is not just one value. Here you have an ordered pair. Then we say that the limit of function f of x and y as x and y approaches the point A and B is L, and we write the limit of f of x and y as x and y goes to A and B is equal to L, if you have the following definition satisfied. If for every number epsilon, epsilon is a very small positive number, you can find another number, delta, which is also positive, such that if x and y belongs to the domain of the function, then the distance between x and y and a and b is less than delta, then you can conclude that the distance between f and l is very small and it is less than epsilon. Visualization, remember that the domain is a subset of the plane. We are getting closer and closer to the point A and B in the domain. And our Z value or the output value is getting closer and closer to L on the real line. Again, here, you have the point A and B, and you're getting closer and closer to the point A and B in the domain, which is part of the plane itself. Then on the surface, which is the visualization of your function f of x and y, as you can see, the z value is getting closer and closer to L. Properties of the limit of functions of two variables. The following holds if L, M, and K are all real numbers. Suppose the limit of F is equal to L and the limit of G is equal to M. First of all, if you add these two functions, you can basically add their limits. If you subtract these two functions, you can subtract their limits as well. Remember, you had multiplication of product rule. If you have two functions and their limit exists, then you can basically take their limits and multiply them together. Constant multiple rule. If k is just a constant multiplied by function f, then taking the limit, you can basically write down k in front of the limit of the function and do the multiplication later. Quotient rule, if you have the division between two functions, the limit of their division or quotient is basically doing the division between their limits. And please note that the denominator cannot be equal to zero. And finally, the power rule. If you have function f 
raised to power r over s when s is not zero and when you're taking the limit you basically can move the limit inside parentheses find the limit of the function and raise that limit to power r over s so these are the properties that you saw in elementary functions as well we can generalize these to multi-variable function here for example consider this function in two variables x and y and as you can see here you have 3x squared y plus square root of xy we want to find a limit as x goes to 2 and y goes to 3 the very first thing you're going to do you're going to do substitution why substitution because 3x squared y is basically a term, nice term. And here you have square root of x times y, which is again a nice function. By substitution, you can basically wherever you see x, plug in 2. And wherever you see y, you're going to plug in 8. It becomes 3 times 4 times 8 plus square root of 2 times 8, which is basically 100. Again, you can follow the rules for limit. Here you have multiplication of x squared, 3x squared, and y. Here we can write 3 in front of the limit of x squared times limit of y. So here you have your 3. You have limit of x squared, which is 2 to the second power times the limit of y, which is 8. And then since you have square root, you can basically find the limit by moving the limit inside the square root. So you have the limit of x, which is 2, and limit of y, which is 8, but everything is inside the square root. And when you simplify this, you have basically the multiplication of the quantities, which is 100. So these are some easy limit calculations for you. Another easy calculations is the limit of x cubed sine of y divided by y. Here you have a function in x and a function in y. x goes to 3 and y goes to 0. Here you have product of two functions. You can easily separate these two and apply the method that you learned in elementary calculus. So you can write it as the limit of x cubed times the limit of sine y divided by y. But limit of x cubed is nothing but 3 to the third power. And as you remember, the limit of sine y over y as y goes to 0 is equal to 1. For this guy, you can also apply the L'Hopital rule. So the limit of sine y over y as y goes to 0 is sine of 0 divided by 0 or 0 over 0. So you can apply L'Hopital rule. This is equivalent to the limit of the derivative of sine, which is cosine y, divided by the derivative of y, which is 1, as y goes to 0, which is cosine of 0 or 1. So that's how you end up with this one here. 3 to the third is 27 times 1 is equal to 27. Let us make it more interesting for you. Remember, in elementary calculus, if we ask you to find the limit of square root of x minus 1 divided by x minus 1, if you do the substitution, the very first thing you're going to see is you have square root of 1 minus 1 divided by 1 minus 1, or you have 0 over 0, and as you remember, it is indeterminate form. One method to solve this problem is applying L'Hopital's rule, or you can use the conjugate. To apply the conjugate method, you're going to write down square root of x minus 1 divided by x minus 1. And you're going to multiply that by the conjugate. 
You're going to rationalize the numerator. Well, the conjugate of square root of x minus 1 is square root of x plus 1. But to balance this, you're going to divide by the same quantity as well. See what happens here. On the numerator, you're going to multiply square root of x by square root of x, then 1, and they're going to multiply negative 1 by square root of x and negative 1 by 1. So you end up with x plus square root of x minus square root of x minus 1 divided by, let us leave the quantity on the denominator as it is. We're going to get rid of the common factors. Please note that you have the opposite terms. You can cancel these two out. You end up with x minus 1 divided by x minus 1 times square root of x plus 1. So here, you can easily get rid of the common factor, and it is equal to 1 divided by square root of x plus 1. Now, basically, you can calculate the limit. It is going to be the limit of 1 over square root of x plus 1, or... 1 over 1 plus 1, which is a half. Again, you could apply L'Hopital's rule and you get the exact same result. You're going to take the derivative of square root of x minus 1 and divide it by the derivative of x minus 1, then take the limit as x goes to 1 here. So let me write this guy up here a little bit so we, not, we have enough space. Limit of square root of x minus 1 derivative divided by x minus 1 derivative as x goes to 1. But the derivative of square root of x is 1 divided by 2 times square root of x. And the derivative of negative 1 is just 0 and divided by 1. As x goes to 1, it is 1 divided by 2 square root of 1, or as you can see, a half. So applying L'Hopital rule or applying the conjugate method, both of them work the same. You get the exact same result back. So what's the use of this? This is what we learned in elementary calculus. We can apply the exact same thing in multivariable calculus. Question says, find the limit of the following function. x goes to 0, y goes to 0. They are getting closer and closer to the origin. So if I plug in 0 and 0, I have 0 minus 0 divided by 0 minus 0, or I end up with 0 over 0. But please note that at this point, even though you have intermediate form, which is 0 over 0, you cannot apply L'Hopital's rule because you don't have one variable. It must be either in x or y, so you can apply L'Hopital's rule. So what we're going to do now, we're going to use the conjugate method. So the limit of x squared minus x times y divided by square root of x minus square root of y is equal to the limit of x squared minus xy divided by square root of x minus square root of y times the conjugate. But what is the conjugate? The conjugate of the denominator is square root of x plus square root of y. We just change the sign. And to balance this, we're going to multiply both the numerator and the denominator by the exact same conjugate. Now we're going to simplify as much as we can. On the numerator, you can factor out x. Please note that here you have x squared 
and you have x times y. So you can factor out x as you can see here. You end up with x times x minus y times square root of x plus square root of y. On the denominator, if you just do the multiplication, square root of x times square root of x is x. Square root of x times square root of y minus square root of y times square root of x, they are opposite of each other, minus square root of y times square root of y, which is just y. So you end up with x minus y on the denominator. Now, this is equal to the limit of x times square root of x plus square root of y. Why is that? Because you can get rid of the common factor, as you can see. So basically, you have limit of x times square root of x plus square root of y, which is 0 times square root of 0 plus square root of 0, or just 0. So you can say that, hey, the limit of this two-variable function around the origin is equal to 0. So again, please note that the L'Hopital's rule is not working in this case because we need to have one variable. It only works if we have one variable. Since you have two variables, one of the methods is using the conjugate or rationalize it.